Right back live tonight here on In Focus, the Gauteng Social Development Department's decision to cut 416 million rands in funding uh, to non-profit organization has raised fears of a repeat of the life of City Many tragedy. MEC Bali Flopi revealed the reprioritization of the budget earlier this month. Worries have been raised that projects may be jeopardized due to a lack of funding. Uh, Gauteng Care Crisis Committee Chairperson Lisa Vetten joins us now uh, for some insight into this. Lisa started with a, a broad consultation or an imbezo of some sort earlier in, 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 in April and it has gone back and forth with a whole lot of issues being mm -hmm. raised but on the 17th it seems there was another meeting, civil society forum represented by its chairperson. Mm -hmm. Others are saying well not all sectors of this uh, 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 particular cluster were represented there but Talk to me about why it seems government and uh, NPOs are not finding each other in this particular matter. Because government, from what I'm hearing, they're saying there are no cuts to the 2.3 billion rand budget allocated to NPOs. You see, that's about 10% accurate. They're quite right. The overall budget allocated to NPOs is 2.3 billion. What they're not telling you is that there are four different programs within that budget to which that money must be distributed. So what they're not telling you is that they cut 417 billion rand from, million rand from the programs that provide social welfare services and services to families and children. They more or less kept the same, the amount of money that goes to what they call restorative services, and then they took the money that they cut from the first two programs and put it all in the program called development and research. So that's what they don't tell you. And they also don't tell you then what the consequences were of that decision to reprioritize. Now, you may have heard them talking a lot about their reprioritization towards an emphasis on poverty alleviation, et cetera, et cetera. Now, obviously, addressing poverty is very important. Unemployment is a very serious problem in South Africa. But the question then becomes, so who, if you're going to prioritize that, then who now is going to be responsible for the programs that have been lost, like child protection, foster care, adoption, residential care for older persons and persons with disabilities, protective workshops, diversion programs to ensure that people, rather than getting caught up in prison life, right. can, can be rehabilitated in other ways. No yeah. thought given to that at all. So, I mean, in those particular four areas, residential care services to old persons, child youth care centers, shelters for women and those with disabilities, mm -hmm. they say will remain funded. In fact, they are saying even as we speak, service level agreements are being finalized. Where are the challenges? Okay, again, that's a little bit disingenuous. So what they, when they say they're funding, I think the one group of services that, that they've more or less spared have been domestic violence shelters and what they call the Victim Empowerment Program. If you, if you run a child protection service, your budget has been cut by 61%. So your social worker, which was, who was earning just over 14,000 rand, is now earning 5,600 rand a month. And that, by the way, is lower than the entry level grade one salary level for somebody in government. So you are now being given 39% of the budget you had last year, but government is expecting you to deliver exactly the same service. So people's targets remain exactly the same as they were last year, although they've only got 39% of the budget. And what they have done to organizations is the following. They've told them to, firstly, they've to, they haven't told them what they're getting in their contracts. So organizations have said, can we see our SLAs before we sign them? Right. And certain um, sections have said, no, you can't. And some of them have been asked to sign blank contracts. I mean, that's simply not, that's simply not lawful. So what, what, what is the challenge here? It seems from the, from the meeting well, that was held last Monday is that there, there, there is this fear uh, within government or concern or maybe legitimate concern that there are ghost NPOs and therefore they're saying they mm -hmm. want to audit these NPOs and be sure about that but also uh, they, they are saying uh, the internal processes uh, of the department must be in line with governance priorities uh, I mean in short for saying there are some governance lapses that have been happening in how this money is being distributed is, is that a genuine concern? Absolutely, and the question you have to ask is what has the Department of Social Development's Monitoring and Evaluation Unit been doing? There are two different sections within DSD that are required to monitor NGOs on a regular basis to see that they are compliant. So how did the Department allow these ghost NPOs to slip through? We've got to ask the Department those kinds of questions.
Yeah, and 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 will now this process of a uh, a committee that started its work on the 18th help to resolve this thing? I mean, they they, they seem to have put together a committee that involves the department, some uh, uh, NPOs, uh, civil society groups, mm -hmm. who are going to now authenticate uh, the number of NPOs that have been approved. Look, I think that's a good start, but you've got to bear in mind that the grouping that, are, that is in there is predominantly from what's called the children's sector in the program that provides HIV funding. I see. So it speaks to nothing at all more broadly. So we don't know what's happening. We don't know where people are at. And that was part of why we held a picket this week was to say, please bring all NPOs in so that they can understand what is going on. And I seriously doubt that there are enough ghost NPOs on there to discover and take back that 417 million rand that has been cut. Yeah. So your, your mass action, is, which seemingly was uh, against the spirit of this signed agreement where they said uh, the, the mass action is going to be put in abeyance while this process of authentication uh, wa wa was being carried out, your, your mass action was, was largely about the fact that not all of you were included in, 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 in this particular agreement. Absolutely, the bulk of us weren't included. And so the issue then becomes you can't put something into a band if you weren't there to be asked to put it in a band. So that's just problem number one. I think also we have to bear in mind that um, this reprioritization has to be rejected and people will continue with their mass action. We've also started legal action against the department, both in terms of the violations of the rights that they have committed against people who require services and are entitled to them in terms of Section 27 of the Constitution. And the other aspect of our legal action against them is the way they have violated organizations' right to administrative justice. So those processes are in place. Hopefully the Department will extend the spirit of generosity and open up discussions to all NPOs, listen, take seriously, and try to find a way to save services to beneficiaries, and we can put their legal action aside. But if that's not going to happen, well, then obviously something else more serious will need to be put in place. Yeah. So are you saying to us that this, this process that uh, seemingly informs this was done unilaterally by government to decide that, okay, these are the areas of priority that we are going to elevate and therefore, uh, uh, instructed by the Premier, it seems, this is where we are going to direct mm. the money. Absolutely. And the letters of termination to, to organizations telling them they won't be funded state that very clearly. They say that in October there was a new premier, um, provincial priorities have been realigned, and now they're realigning the budget. Now, in terms of administrative justice, that should have, they should have begun immediately a process of consultation that should have ended by 51st of March, the end of the financial year. They did none of that. Instead, they waited, in the, waited until the beginning, middle and some organizations still don't know to start saying to organizations, oh, so sorry, your staff don't have um, jobs at the end of the month. I think, you know, one of the organizations who's closing at the end of the month deals with over 1,200 people with disabilities. They phoned up the department and to, to speak to the social worker to say, we're bringing you our case files because we cannot just abandon people. They continue to need services. And the department's response was, please don't do that. We can't manage. Please, please don't do that. That just tells you something about the lack of thought that went into this. There's another organization that deals with some 22,000 people across the province through diversion programs, people who we look at community um, service rather than putting them in prison. The courts weren't prepared for this. The Department of Correctional Services wasn't prepared for this. Those programs have come to an end. As of April, there will be no further programs. The only program in the province that deals with children who are, who have been, who are guilty or have been or who seem guilty of sexual offences, that program has been terminated. That program prevented children from going to prison. Now what happens to those programs? So I think, you know, there's just the lack of thought given to the impact on people who had access to something and has just been taken away from them with no thought given to what is the alternative that is going to be put in place. Yeah. So are, are those the programs that you're talking about that were given those letters that say the services that you are rendering are not aligned with our priorities uh, as a department for 2023-2024? They said that in, in so many words. Exactly. They also say that mental health services are not their priority. So Gordonia, for instance, which is a, a centre in Bertrams, they've lost their, their they've lost their social worker. How can you run a residential facility with people, for people with disabilities? 
without a social worker. There are outreach programs in Soweto, Davyton, Etwatwa that serve up to almost 10,000 people a year. They've also been told not a priority. People with depression who are suicidal or who have other difficulties, not a priority. They'll have to go and find their, they will have to go and be helped somewhere else by somebody else. Yeah. So there is, you're saying, uh, Lisa, no plan as to where do you now take mm. these people, even though you've mm. cut the salary of the social worker from, from 13,000 to 5,000? There, there, from what we've seen so far, there is no plan. I mean, some of the last of the organizations on Friday, they were still being phoned up by the DSD saying, come in and sign your SLA. And when they got there, were being presented with a blank SLA, being asked to run and sign a contract to provide a service when they don't even know how much money they've got for that service. So we're, in the, we're at the point now where over the coming week, we're going to try and scope the extent of the closures, the damage, and this crisis in care, quite frankly. Um, and I think by the end of the week, we'll be able to put out some kind of picture um, of what this looks like. We, I can tell you now, just from three organizations already, you're talking about 200 people who've lost their jobs and some 15,000 people who've lost access to services. That's three organizations alone. A diversion, a disability and mental health service, and a diversion program. Now, I, I don't have the number here. I'm trying to remember it off, off, off the top of my head because I had this conversation about two weeks ago, but I forgot now what, what the number is. But from, from the briefing that the, the, the MEC had, it seems there is a number of um, uh, 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 internal social workers who are already in, in the system of, of, of the department mm. um, who would need to be mm. distributed uh, as opposed to these, to these particular areas. What is your understanding of that? There's no clarity. If the department is doing that, that's very important because it would be too terrible to simply dump people with nothing. But again, the fact that they haven't done that, that a social worker is saying, please don't bring us your caseload, talks to the lack of planning that has gone into this. If when this reprioritization had, was beside in October, if a proper consultation had been process had been followed, if there had been thinking through of this, if there had been questions to NGOs about what is the size of your caseload, how can we redistribute it, then there would be no crisis on the 1st of April. But none of that has happened. So we don't even know. From what I can see, the only place where um, the Department of Social Development has really increased the numbers of social workers has been in relation to child protection. But we have no idea if that's enough to take up to take over what organizations have been providing. And it's already clear if you look at their budget votes that they fully intend to cut services because if you look at their targets for residential facilities for um, people with disabilities, that already indicates 220 people are going to get few, fewer services than last year. It's also evident that three, just over 3,000 older persons will not be getting access to drop-in centers where they can get a meal, where they can socialize, where they can talk to a social worker. Their own budget vote shows those cuts. And, you can, and there has been no engagement with NGOs about what's, who is going to pick this up. And so I think one of the concerns about this is that are they expecting NGOs to work at very considerably reduced rates? And I must tell you, I was looking at a, an SLA from an organization in Mamadodi last week. They have had a member, they've had members of staff who work on the Orphans and Vulnerable Children's Program. Their monthly salaries have been cut to 827 rand. That is so far below the minimum wage is embarrassing. It's below even the poverty line. So, I mean, in the name of cutting poverty, the department has unfortunately created poverty for a whole lot of, um, of, of people. So, once again, it's a sign of not having thought through, not having planned. And I think just looking at the budget and saying, we'll just cut 61% across the board, regardless of the service. Because I can tell you now, there's no DSD social worker who's going to be working for 827 rand um, per month. So you can see some sort of planning with a few programs, but the bulk there hasn't been. And they certainly aren't equipped to take over 22,000 people in a diversion program. From, from the attitude that I'm getting here uh, from, from, from what has been reported as the response by the department spokesperson saying that the department's decision to reprioritize budgets rested with them and their departmental needs. The Premier sets policy directives uh, and departments uplift those areas, but the business plans are those of the department. That's the spokesperson of the Premier almost saying, well, it's not really the...
premier who determines how those budgets are going to be cut. He sets the directives, but the departments themselves are the ones who would then need to prioritize and, and, and come up with, with business plans as to how they're going to s split the money. I, is that something that you see ending up being challenged somewhere in court? Yes, because of course that it is entirely correct. It is a, it is a government's pr prerogative to decide where they want to spend their money. Nobody disputes that. However, when you have such a massive policy shift that is also, in my opinion, in contravention with national policy and national norms and standards around the quality of social welfare services, you need to consult with it very, very carefully. I've already been part of a case in the Eastern Cape where the department um, lost on that for failing to consult properly. This case, the lack of consultation, if anything, is even worse. So this is the problem, is that the department has not thought through what it's doing, it has not done the necessary consultation, and it has not met the right to administrative justice. What it has done is that it has created a reasonable expectation amongst NGOs that they will continue to fund their social care services. And in fact, I think we should stop talking about this as funding to NGOs. It's funding for social care. It's funding to support and care for and ensure the safety of vulnerable groups of people. NGOs are merely the vehicle. So if the department has decided that caring for vulnerable people is no longer their priority, they can do that. But who is now going to do so? Because there is a constitutional duty on the state to take care of, of those groups of people. And if DSD does not want to do that, then who is going to do that? Will it be the Department of Health or will it be nobody at all? Because the assumption seems to be here that what the department can do is cut the services and simply push all that caring work back onto what will probably be women's family members that they can rely on women to pick up the slack and take on a whole lot of unpaid care work um, as a result of this reprioritization. So there's no thinking of the broader ripple effects that this will have on, say, women who are working and now have to sit and think, do I carry on working and leave my member of family at home who has a disability and does require care? Do I leave them alone to, the, or all, to their own devices every day? Do I look for substandard care or do I give up my job? so that I can stay home and care for somebody who needs it and who I love and care for in, 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 in uh, turn and want to ensure that they stay safe and are looked after. Lisa so, I mean, those are the kinds of choices. Let's leave it there for tonight. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for coming on. Lisa Vertin, chairperson of the Gauteng Care Crisis uh, Committee. They're raising concerns around the Gauteng Department of Social Development's reprioritization uh, program.